uh, right now, today. But if anyone is interested, uh, you are more than welcome to talk to me uh, after the lecture or send me an email. Uh, and this is pretty important for many uh, reasons. Um, and um, now, uh, Katrina was talking about uh, ChatGPT, but I am doing this a little broader. I'm generally looking at generative artificial intelligence and how it can make you be a better student and how you can use it in your studies. Uh, this is also a little bit because we have to make sure we use it the correct way. We don't use it for cheating. And uh, today we are going to look at, uh, I have a lot in my slides today. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, just uh, ask me. And, and I'm also recording this lecture, but I'm also, I'm just recording my side of the lecture. So if anyone wants to speak, don't be afraid that your voice is going to show up in a video. Uh, I am just recording my voice and my screen. Uh, so today we're going to look at what is generative AI actually. Uh, AI's uh, influence on society, uh, it is already getting big, but it's going to be a lot bigger in a few years. AI for learning, uh, because you are master students, so of course uh, learning is a very important part of uh, what you're doing every day. Uh, AI for writing, because AI can be a phenomenal tool for writing. AI for research, uh, this is something I'm also teaching the uh, master students that are doing the thesis later this week. And AI for coding, um, a little bit prompt engineering because you have to know how to talk to these AI systems to actually be able to get proper responses. And that is called prompt engineering or prompt design. And some challenges, pitfalls, and ethics. Uh, because you are students, which means you have to use this in an ethical way and uphold the uh, ethics standards of the university. Uh, so it's very important that you actually think about what you're doing with these technologies. And I have a couple of bonus chapters, which is uh, not as much about like your studies, but more about your life outside of the studies, because uh, you also have to do stuff like eating and uh, socializing. Many of you might have seen some of these papers uh, in the newspapers, uh, like researchers revealed that paper about academic cheating was generating usage using ChatGPT, and this actually passed peer review which means um, someone didn't really read it well enough, maybe. And more than half of college students believe using ChatGPT to complete assignments is cheating. Uh, we're going to look more at that later. And uh, chatting and cheating, uh, this, is, this is a publication um, ensuring academic integrity in the area of ChatGPT, which is actually a real challenge these days. But you also have like the positives. ChatGPT passes exam from law and business schools. Um, the newest version of ChatGPT can get a US medical license and diagnose a one in 100,000 condition in seconds. And the GPT version 4, which is only now available as a paid version, um, can pass everything from bar exams to AP Biology, which means these tools are very, very powerful, but there are, of course, a lot of limitations too. Generative AI is a collective term for all of these tools. Uh, tools like ChatGPT, Bing Chat, um, uh, Bard Chat from Google, and also image generators and so much more. Uh, what is it and what is it not? Because uh, the what is it not is also very important in this. This is a definition from McKinsey and Company, which is one of the biggest accounting firms in the world and business uh, consultants in the world. And they define generative AI as generative artificial intelligence describes algorithms such as ChatGPT that can be used to create new content, including audio, code, images, text, simulations, and videos. Recent breakthroughs in the fields have the potential to drastically change the way we approach content creation. But personally, I feel that it has the way to drastically change the way we do a lot of things and also our jobs. This is an article from Bill Gates. Uh, I hope everyone in this room knows who Bill Gates is um, because he is kind of one of the founders of our uh, field. 
And he has said that the age of AI has begun and it's a big, as big as a revolution as the mobile phone and the internet. But it's very important to know that AI is not a new thing. Uh, a lot of you are probably going to do AI or machine learning, deep learning in your masters uh, as your focus. Um, and we've been working on this for many, many years. But in December 2022, we had a revolution in the way we use AI in society. Not AI in general, because we have already had pretty good AI systems from before that. But that is the time where everyone started using AI. And that was, of course, with the launch of ChatGPT. And now we're seeing an exponential growth of new AI tools. Uh, I promise you, if you start looking into this, uh, you will be very quickly overwhelmed. Uh, there are new tools coming out every day, every hour for that matter. And the use of AI is also skyrocketing. Uh, the number of users for ChatGPT now is through the roof because everyone is back at school again. Uh, over the summer, they had a little slump and they were worried, but now it's uh, very high again. And all of the other AI tools, just look at Microsoft, look at Google. Uh, they're all launching a lot of new tools uh, that can be used also in your uh, existing tools. And academic use. I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, uh, but I find it very important to mention it already in the beginning of the lecture uh, because there also is a big chance of misuse of these tools. Uh, AI can be used to help you find research papers, uh, help you correct your spelling mistakes. AI is uh, like a word autocorrect version 5000. It's very good at it. Uh, but it can also code for you, and it can do data analysis. Uh, I've uh, experimented a lot with that lately, lately in ChatGPT, and it's absolutely amazing. It can make outlines for what you're working on. Uh, it can help you create new ideas and be creative, and it can do so much more. These new tools are really uh, an amazing amazing addition to the tool case you have as a student. But it can also be used for cheating. It's very important to avoid copying things from ChatGPT, copying things from other AI tools, and especially saying that it's yours, saying that you created this when in reality you did not. And AI is everywhere. There is an AI tool now for everything, and there's also a lot of tools that say they are AI, but in reality, they're not, so be careful about that. But ChatGPT sparked an AI gold rush. Uh, there are now startups that started two weeks ago that get a $100 million evaluation and gets a lot of money to fund their startup just because they're throwing the word AI in there. There are more AI tools than you can use. Uh, I tried for a little while to keep updated on all of them, but I quickly uh, surrendered and gave up because it's too uh, difficult. You have tools for voice. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of this later. Uh, text, of course, ChatGPT and friends. Uh, video AI, you have AIs that generate whole videos for you now. Image generators. Uh, on that note, all of the images in this presentation, unless they are screenshots, are actually generated by AI. And you have business AI, specialized AIs that are made for a specific use case. Uh, Microsoft is coming out with a lot of them now in uh, Outlook, in uh, Word, and so forth. Uh, but you also have them for specific things like uh, day trading and so forth. But you also have narrow AI. Uh, all of these... AIs we are seeing in the media these days, they are so-called generalized AIs that can be used for a lot of things. But narrow AI is what we've had up till this point. Things like self-driving cars, robots, and so much more. Recommender systems are uh, an example of that. Uh, Amazon has been using that for a very long time. And this is more of a theoretical thing, but I think it's important that you guys know difference between narrow and general AI, just because 
it kind of inflect, uh, it impacts the way you use the tools and what tools you end up using. And especially if someone here are going to do uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, master thesis, then it's uh, kind of important to know this difference. And narrow AI, they solve one problem and one problem only. Uh, things like I mentioned recommender systems. Uh, Amazon has been doing this for a while. YouTube is doing this. Uh, Netflix is doing this. Uh, Self-driving cars, they're a pretty narrow AI. They take a lot of inputs and they map the way you should be driving. Uh, facial recognition is also a narrow AI use case. When we come to general AI, we have all the AIs that can do many tasks. So for instance, ChatGPT, it can um, more or less do anything you ask it to, as long as it has the tools available. Uh, for now, in the free version, that means it can handle text and give you text back. Uh, but with some of the examples where people are using the uh, ChatGPT uh, APIs for making their own solution, uh, it can also do a lot more. Uh, so it's more of a generalized AI that understands humans in a way. Uh, I want to say understand here with uh, air quotes because there is a discussion if it really understands or not. But general AI like ChatGPT, Bard Chat, and Bing Chat and so forth, they can do a lot of different tasks. And they have more generalized models that can do the different tasks. The basis of a lot of these tools are so-called LLMs or large language models. And they are based on transformers, uh, which is a new, um, well, fairly new um, model of making deep neural networks. And what they in reality do is that they predict the next word in a sentence, which means Technically, they're the same as you have on your phone, uh, the predictive text functionality, but they're a lot smarter than that. Uh, they are trained on trillions of tokens, which equals roughly a word. And they also give you an answer in the context of the question you asked, which means they are a lot smarter than the normal predictive text functionality uh, because they have the knowledge of these trillions of tokens and they are predicting the next word based on that context. And they can be used as for a lot more than just text. Um, today we are seeing mostly text-based tools, uh, but just know that these tools are so-called multi multimodal models, which means they can also uh, see videos, they can also uh, hear sounds and pictures and interpret that. And some of these can also use tools. Uh, Google just launched uh, a while ago a research paper where they use an LLM to actually control a robot in real life and um, uh, pick up objects based on the understanding of an explanation of that object. Uh, unfortunately, most of these multimodal uh, versions are limited to only researchers at Microsoft, OpenAI, and so on. Uh, but that is something we're going to see in the next couple of years uh, a lot more of. Um, this is maybe not that useful for your master uh, studies, but uh, one other uh, version, well, on one other technology that's a lot used these days are diffusion models. And the best example of that is stable diffusion, which is uh, used for generating images and videos. Uh, and technically, they could also be done for uh, audio, but uh, I, I haven't seen any examples of that yet. What they do is they add noise to an image. So if they're generating an image for you, they are... Um, on the right here, I think it's going to be right for you guys too. My screens are a little opposite. Um, you have a very fussy image, and then it tries to generate that into a coher coherent image that looks like an actual image. And these are also trained on billions of images. They get images, no uh, add noise to them, and then try to uh, make them back into actual images. And it gives amazing, amazing results. Uh, there's a lot of examples of uh, pretty amazing uh, AI-generated uh, images these days. And I would say that you can use that to make illustrations for uh, something you're working on or just make a cool picture. 
And of course, there are a billion other models. Uh, this screenshot is from something called Hugging Face. And uh, this screenshot was taken two weeks ago uh, at 272,901 uh, models available. These are just the open source models. Uh, I checked in the end of last week and then there was 312,000 models and it keeps going up every single day. Um, there are a lot of models for a lot of things. A lot of these models are narrow AI, except for the most popular ones like Stable Diffusion, uh, Llama 2, and so on. Uh, they are um, either diffusion models or LLM, LLMs. But a lot of the models on Hugging Face are um, narrow AI, things for robotics, things for um, image recognition, and so on. And this is pretty much out outside of the scope of this lecture, but uh, my thinking whenever I see this number is what if we can combine them all? What if we can have uh, large language models using tools? Uh, there has been some examples of that out there, uh, but not a lot yet. So, AI in society. What will the world look like when you graduate? Um, I am pretty sure it's going to be uh, different than now. I'm kind of hoping it's going to be different than now, uh, but time will tell. And maybe the most important thing to think about is that a lot of um, companies, a lot of analysts are predicting that uh, a lot of jobs will be lost to artificial intelligence because this technology can automate away a lot of the uh, so-called boring jobs. And then there is obviously a lot of people that are going to lose their job. Um, like here, Goldman Sachs predicts 300 million jobs will be lost or degraded by artificial intelligence. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, AI can destroy humanity. I do not uh, prescribe to that thought, but there's a lot of uh, researchers and industry leaders that warn about it. Um, and there's a lot of people that are calling for a six-month pause on AI development. Of course, they're calling for it, but mostly so they can catch up. But also, it's pretty much uh, not needed now because there's no, there's not enough GPUs in the world to keep training anyways. Others are talking about how AI might save the world. And I'm kind of more in this camp. Um, things like... Uh, making new medicines, uh, preventing uh, global warming, and so on, uh, is something AI can help us with. Uh, yeah, more examples of why AI will save the world. This is uh, written by Mark Andreessen, uh, which is a very big investment uh, person. He owns uh, a very big investment firm. And of course, some are saying uh, that uh, Sam Altman is walking around with a nuclear sub, uh, suitcase um, because uh, AI might destroy the world. So he needs a way to turn off his servers. Um, but that's a discussion for another interview, uh, another, um, uh, another time, I guess. AI will undoubtedly change the world and we can't stop it. Uh, I see a lot of talk about uh, let's pause development, let's ban AI, but you can't stop it. Uh, the cat is out of the bag and there is no going back. You can't put the cat back in the bag. Uh, I see a typo. Uh, AI will change the world and it will also change work. It will change your personal life. It will change how education is done. And my question is, do we really want to stop it? Because there are so many upsides to this. Of course, there are some drawbacks and downsides, but uh, I am in the camp there where I believe that we should not try to stop this. This is the biggest and most influential invention of humanity. Things like automated research. Uh, have auto autonomous agents that do the work Given, you give them a case, you give them a specification, and they will do the work for you. They can. We have some examples of this. AutoGPT uh, kind of works. Baby AI and so many others. They can do auto 
uh, made it research. They can also use physical equipment if you give them access to it. Uh, per now, there's not a lot of uh, tests done on this. I know Google is doing some, uh, but it can be done. And the good thing then is that AI can help us solve the world's problems. Uh, things like climate change, diseases, poverty, food scarcity. Uh, if you have AI that grows you food 24-7 uh, in the optimal, optimal way with no human interfa interference, you can solve food scarcity. Things like fusion power. If you have a million of these AIs that are working only on fusion power 24-7, we might be able to, at some point, solve that. Because these can work 24-7 with no breaks, no sleep, no food. Uh, the only thing they need is electricity and some GPUs. And electricity, I'm sure we're going to figure that out. Uh, the GPUs, well, at some point, we'll figure out how to make enough of those two. But the point is that these can solve a lot of problems because they can work on this uh, with no rest, with no breaks, no sleep, food, anything. Uh, and we can also, of course, have thousands or millions of these agents working on the same problem or different problems to try and solve uh, the problems we as a species have created. The downside is, of course, jobs. Uh, the estimates are one-fifth of all jobs will be obsolete or automated away. Uh, so they will replace a lot of jobs. Of course, new jobs will come, uh, new jobs in AI, new jobs um, making AI or fine-tuning AI or babysitting AI for that matter um, will replace them. But uh, there will be uh, a very quick change and there will be societal problems, societal effects for a while. So I would suggest to everyone here that uh, learning AI tools, learning to use them, learning to work with them uh, is a very good way of making sure you get a job uh, when you're done with your education. There are some dangers, uh, like real dangers, not just some jobs are going to be replaced. Uh, there is no free lunch after all. Uh, Technology that can be used for good can also be used for bad. That's uh, unfortunately a thing that's never going away. Uh, researchers and politicians around the world are trying to solve this problem, uh, but they are trying to solve it by banning uh, technology, uh, which isn't really going to work. Um, and of course, super intelligence. Uh, if we have an AI that's uh, a million times more intelligent than humans, that would also potentially be scary. Uh, but it depends on what we do with it. And this article is an example of uh, an AI used for developing uh, drugs, uh, so good drugs, not bad drugs, uh, to cure diseases. Uh, was also um, able to invent 40,000 potentially lethal molecules for bioweapons, chemical weapons, and so forth um, in six hours when it was put to that use. Uh, so the models then can be used to find uh, a cure for cancer can also be used to maybe make the next pandemic or make the next uh, bioweapon. But that's the uh, introduction, bad, good, uh, and so on. Uh, from now on, I'm going to look at actually using these AIs in a uh, master thesis or master uh, studies uh, perspective. Uh, things like my first, learning. How to use generative AI to learn more effectively. Uh, I've actually started using a lot of these uh, strategies myself, and they are very effective. Um, AI can be your personal teacher uh, when you're trying to learn new concepts. Uh, here I just asked ChatGPT uh, to explain uh, the concept of tokens, which are basically almost like words, but not really. Uh, in large language models for me. And it gave me a pretty okay explanation of that. And the positive here is that you can follow up, you can ask more questions uh, until you really understand the topic. If there is something in this text you don't understand, you can ask it to explain it further or you can ask it to kind of dumb it down for you. Um, a lot of examples of uh, show me this, uh, like explain this like I was six years old uh, are going around and has been going around since ChatGPT launched. And that is, of course, something you can do. Uh, but you can also make it explain it to you based on the level you are. 
the positive thing here is that it's always available. Uh, I'm not saying, and I will never say that ChatGPT and the other AI tools is a replacement for uh, your lecture, replacement for your teacher or for your uh, thesis uh, guidance. It is a good tool, it's not a replacement, but the positive thing is that it's always available. Um, these are available 24 seven, so whenever you are unsure about something, you're working on something, you can get an answer right away instead of having to wait for the answer. And these systems learn, knows a lot about a lot of topics. Um, I've tested so many different things uh, for my uh, guest lectures and for my own experimentation and Everything that's known before 2021, uh, Gus ChatGPT stopped training, uh, collecting training data in 2021. Uh, everything before that, uh, ChatGPT can give you a pretty good answer to. Of course, with some asterisks about uh, misinformation and so on, but I'm going to get to that later. Um, so, but it knows a lot about a lot of topics, and it's not always perfect but it is a starting point. If you're trying to learn something new, uh, trying to uh, get more information about a topic you're already working on, it can be a phenomenal phenomenal help in um, getting the basic knowledge. But of course, you have to do some research yourself to check that you actually get correct answers because sometimes it will give you wrong answers and you wouldn't really want that to be memorized, um, but mostly nowadays they give you factual information. Summarizing text, uh, here I've used Bing Chat uh, because Bing Chat have access to the internet, which ChatGPT does not, uh, with some exceptions if you're paying for it. Uh, but Bing Chat has access to the internet. I've made it, uh, asked it to summarize an article. Uh, this was an article written on a podcast, what they were talking about and uh, what the conversation was going on and the main topics uh, on that. And I asked it to summarize the text for me. And it gave me a pretty uh, good um, summarization of that article. And it was a pretty long article because I think this was an, an hour podcast episode. And it can do it in seconds, which means you can read more information quicker. And I would say maybe this is mostly useful if you're going to read a lot of research papers. Uh, I know that a lot of your courses uh, for the rest of your two years in the master's program is going to involve you reading a lot of research papers and reading a lot of information. And not all of the information you find is uh, good uh, information for what you're actually researching. It's not relevant. And then you can use the AI to actually summarize this for you and give you an idea if this is worth actually reading the whole paper or not. Uh, and maybe even give you all the information you needed from that paper uh, in the summarization. So you can avoid reading long articles that aren't relevant for you. Because uh, that's something we maybe spend a lot of time on uh, and effectivizing this and making it easier to get through all of your readings uh, in a way that you still acquire the knowledge is very useful. Uh, and then you can also use the time you have to read what is relevant, not what is irrelevant. And you can also use it to find correlations between different texts. So if you use it, use it to summarize, uh, let's say, 10 articles, you can use it to actually find the correlations between these texts and uh, what are the main points for the different texts and then maybe read, maybe end up reading all of them, uh, but then at least you know uh, what they have in common. Ideation, uh, this is uh, my favorite word since I started working on AI, but it can help you get new ideas. Um, AI can be very creative just because it has read trillions of words, uh, which means it has a lot of knowledge and then it can also be very creative. Um, here I used uh, Bard Chat, which is Google's uh, version of Bing Chat. Not as good as um, no Google's version of um, ChatGPT. I mean, it's not as good as ChatGPT, but it's uh, free and it's um, pretty okay. Uh, 
and it has more updated information. I asked it to give me five ideas on topics um, to research in climate change and global warming uh, that could make for an interesting article. Uh, prof preferably novel topics uh, where there is uh, some research already done, but the field is pretty open for uh, more research. And it gave me five uh, pretty okay ideas. Uh, I would maybe uh, write my uh, prompt, uh, my text a little different uh, to get more interesting ideas, uh, but it is uh, a good starting point. And I would say that using it to brainstorm new ideas for research, reading, business ideas, and so much more is a very good use of this technology. It does it in seconds. And uh, it's uh, often a lot more creative than you and me can be. Um, and of course, it's very good to make sure you don't forget anything, especially let's say you're working on a paper, uh, make it give you ideas for a paper in the specific field you are working in. And maybe it will give you some ideas you didn't think about so you can change your idea a little bit or uh, expand on your idea with uh, things you haven't thought about. Uh, discussions. Uh, this is actually a very fun one. You can have discussions with specialists and historical figures. Uh, of course, they aren't really historical figures. They aren't really specialists. It's still ChatGPT. Uh, but the point here is if you give ChatGPT a role uh, or um, a person to be, it will more likely give you good answers based on that role. Uh, so you can have a discussion with a subject matter expert. Uh, so you can ask it to be a physicist. You can ask it to be a programmer. You can ask it to be whatever you want. Um, and it will give you answers in that role uh, as long as you keep that conversation going. And you can have a discussion with historical figures. I've seen a lot of uh, people have fun uh, with giving it a role from a book and asking it to answer like the person in that book would and it gives you pretty good answers on that. And it's also good to make sure you see all sides of an argument. If you're having a discussion with it uh, about, uh, let's say, um, how AI will uh, impact our world, uh, you can discuss back and forth and make sure that you get all of the ideas, all of the sides of a discussion. Um, let's say you pick the positive one like me and you have the AI be the negative one. Uh, they, it's going to destroy the world um, uh, version of this conversation. And then uh, you can make sure that you actually have those points also that you have evaluated those points. Um, and discussions in general is a very good way of learning. Uh, having discussions in class, having discussions with other students is a very, very good way of actually actively learning uh, what you are going through because it makes you memorize it better. It makes you think better and it's a form of active learning. Um, so having a discussion with the AI then uh, will do the same for you. And it will also give you, if you're saying something that's, clearly wrong, it will give you uh, a correction on that. Uh, and in the same way, flashcards, uh, you're all going to have exams. Uh, I know that's the highlight of the year. Um, but um, to prepare for an exam, to prepare for a class discussion and so forth, flashcards are very good for that. Um, it can generate flashcards for you to practice for a test, exam, and so forth in more or less any topic. And it gives you also the right answer and explanation if you are wrong. Here I just had, um, uh, I asked it to be my quizzing partner, and we had a discussion about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I said that we are working at university level, which means there is a uh, expectation of some knowledge and um, let's have a this guy have a quiz about this and it asked me uh, a question I answer and it will give me then uh, if I am correct or not and also explain uh, why that's the right answer or wrong answer if it's wrong answer it will give you a better explanation and you can keep this going forever uh, to um, get ready for an exam or a test or a presentation for that matter. 
And you can also ask follow-up questions if you're unsure about something. So uh, if, let's say, I answered this question wrong and it gave me the correct answer, I can ask follow-up questions to make sure it uh, that I really get the concept before I have a test. And uh, this isn't directly in the learning category, but it's important nonetheless. And I would say that it fits in a lot of these categories, the translations. Um, AI systems uh, are very good languages and it can translate just about any language you are working with. So that means that you can read texts in languages you don't know. And just before anyone uh, thinks it, uh, no, it's not like Google Translate. Google Translate uh, more or less trans uh, translates word for word. And you do get a lot of errors, like sentence structure errors and also sometimes meaning errors. But with uh, the AI tools, they will translate it in the context it's actually written, which means you get a pretty perfect translation. So you can read text in any language you don't know, and you can also write in any language you don't know. Um, and I would say that this is uh, one of the very undersold but very valuable parts of these AI tools uh, that it eliminates the language barriers. You can, uh, your main language, your native language can be any language and you can still understand any language with the help of these tools, which is very, very useful and uh, also something that can de democratize education and knowledge. And you can also use it to simplify text. Here I just found a French text on the internet and made it translated. Uh, this is also uh, ChatGPT. But you can also make it simplify or rewrite the text for you in another voice, in another, uh, as a character, um, to or explain it to you like you were five. Like simplify this uh, text about quantum physics uh, like I was five. Um, and it will do it, even if it's in another language. And as I mentioned, it's way, way better than Google Translate. And the second most important thing as a student, uh, the first is maybe learning, the second is uh, writing. You can use uh, generative AI to write more effectively and better, more correctly. Um, I just added the ideation here again, because if you're writing a text, the ideas is very important and you can get novel and interesting ideas to work on. Um, gives you ideas to what to write about. Um, make sure you don't forget anything. Um, this is mostly the same as the learning, but uh, if you are writing a paper, if you're writing a text, uh, it's very good to use these tools to make sure you don't forget anything. Make sure you have a actually have a good idea and also make sure that what you're writing hasn't already been written. And outlines, it's very good at making outlines for you. Um, here I made it make me an outline for an academic research paper uh, on the use of genera generative AI in academia. Um, there are some pain points there that I would probably change myself, but overall it's a pretty good outline for that article. Um, and it made it in 20 seconds, maybe. Text generation. And here I have a very big asterisk for you guys. It can generate sample texts about a topic you are working on. So let's say you have writer's block. That's not unheard of, not unusual, uh, and also not a problem. But if you have writer's block, you're writing a paper thesis and so forth, and you're unsure what to write, uh, it can generate very convincing and good uh, text sample text. Um, it can make sure you get everything that you actually want in the text. Uh, I've just given it a very short and easy prompt. Uh, write a few paragraphs on using LLMs in academia, what's the positive and what are the negatives. Pre please write in a formal academic language. And the text is pretty okay, but don't ever use the text as your own. Don't say that you wrote something the AI wrote for you uh, because there are 
a lot of things AR are good at, and they are being marketed as a text writing tool. Uh, but if you really go into this and read the text, you will see that it's very verbose, it's very overwritten, and it doesn't really make sense as a text you're, you would write yourself. But by all means, use it to get examples. Use it to um, make sample text for you so you can get over writing's block, but never, ever, ever copy text from ChatGPT into something you're writing. Uh, firstly, because that's academic dishonesty, it's cheating. Uh, but secondly, also because you are not gonna get the good results you're hoping for by doing that because the text is very overwritten. Because uh, the AI think we like very long sentences, very long text, very long content, and that's not always true. Uh, so, here I have a very big asterisk. You are free to use it to generate text, but don't pass it off as your own. And um, also for the writing uh, translations, uh, you can write in any language you want and translate it into, for instance, English. Uh, English is the academic language uh, for the masters at our university. And sometimes uh, you aren't comfortable writing something in English because it feels better to write it in your native tongue. Um, and then you can easily have it translated from um, your native tongue to English, for instance, or the other way around. Grammatical corrections. Um, remember, this is about the writing and GPT and all the other tools, I would say that maybe for grammat grammatical corrections, I would probably use ChatGPT um, because it's uh, the most well solid option. Um, but all of them can do this. Um, AI is very good at grammar. Uh, give it your text and it can highlight your mistakes and it can also highlight potential hard sentence stru structures and so forth. It is really spell checker version 5000. Um, and you can feed it a fairly long text and have it um, make sure that it's grammatically correct, that everything is good. Uh, here I just took a simple example text um, from the internet again and had it uh, correct all the mistakes, uh, but I would Probably if I'm writing a paper or writing a thesis or writing something I'm going to hand in, I would probably have it point out the mistakes instead so you can fix them because not all the mistakes it identifies are actual mistake mistakes. Um, but it is very good at languages. So grammatically correcting your text, it's uh, very good at that. And uh, language help. Uh, make sure your text works well, uh, the last one was grammatical corrections, and this one is very related, but um, still a little bit different. Make sure your text actually works. Um, here I gave it um, some uh, example texts. Uh, they're actually both generated by ChatGPT, uh, but I first made it um, make it to me as a very uh, verbal text. So it's more like you would speak it than how you would uh, actually write it. And then I made it um, make it more formal and academic. Um, so if you're unsure about your text, if it's uh, good enough, if it's um, academic, ac academic enough, you can always have ChatGPT or the other tools uh, go through it for you and suggest ways to make it more formal, make it more appropriate for, for instance, a publication. And it can also fix sentences, spelling mistakes, uh, sentence structures, which is a good thing. Uh, difficult language, it can simplify difficult language. Uh, if you've written something that's maybe not the correct way of writing it, it can simplify that for you. Uh, but it can also do stuff like uh, word uh, dividing. Um, I'm not sure what that is in English, actually. In Norwegian, it's orddeling. Um, and that's something that personally I'm very bad at but um, it can fix it for you.
or it can help you fix it. And on the writing image generation, uh, there are a lot of free tools for this. Uh, don't worry, the best ones are maybe paid, but uh, a lot of these uh, free tools exist and it can generate images to illustrate hard concepts. Uh, I've started using that a lot uh, for things I'm doing um, to actually generate illustrations to uh, explain hard concepts. Uh, or it can just be to avoid copyright problems. Uh, AI-generated images are uh, not copyrightable for now, um, so there is not a problem using AI-generated images. For instance, like now I'm using a lot of AI-generated images and I'm gonna publish uh, this video on YouTube after the fact, and I'm not afraid to get a copyright strike or uh, get a bill in the post uh, for using images. Uh, I'm not gonna go into image generation, but I would say, um, things like mid-journey uh, stable diffusion, which is a local installation. Granted, you need uh, okay hardware to do that. Um, and Leonardo AI, which is a free uh, image generation tool. I would highly suggest checking out if you want to make some AI images or illustrations. Um, and Dolly 2, I wouldn't suggest using it, but I just added it here. Dolly 3 is soon coming. I see that the time is uh, 12.03, so uh, I'm guessing for the people in the classroom, maybe a little break. Yep, get the Um. Altså, det er vel egentlig helt opp til dere som faktisk er der i klasserommet, tenker jeg. Ja, helt i orden. There. I uh, guess uh, quarter past. Um. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I stopped at the uh, research, um, becoming a research master, master with generative AI. And here I just need to preface, uh, not all of the tools uh, that I've been talking about so far, uh, Bing Chat, Bard Chat and ChatGPT are very good at this, uh, but uh, most of them can help you some. Um, ChatGPT, uh, if you want to use it for research, you have to pay for it, unfortunately. And <clears throat> here it's uh, the same. I am adding ideation to all of the faces here because when you're doing research, it's very important to know what you're actually researching. Have a broader scope when you're starting than you think you might need to make sure that you find everything. And to do that, uh, you can use, uh, here I have used um, uh, Bard Chat. I've just alternated a little bit between Bard Chat, Bing Chat, and ChatGPT because they're the biggest actors for now. And um, you can make it uh, help you generate ideas on a topic that you're looking into. So if you're looking into, for instance, like uh, here, uh, generative AI's um, image generators and how they will impact society, then maybe you are just thinking about uh, ethical uh, aspects, but then you can get a little broader uh, search terminology before you start actually looking for research. To make sure you get all the angles, all the views, all the points about this topic when you're going into the research phase itself. And making very sure that you don't forget anything because nothing is worse than uh, being uh, like a day into your research. You've spent a whole uh, working day on researching and then suddenly you figure out that there is something you forgot about this topic and you kind of have to start over. Uh, literature search. Um, and I just said that ChatGPT is not the best for this, uh, but this is ChatGPT Plus, which means it's the premium version, which has plugins and can search the internet. 
here you can find reference papers and I overheard uh, a little of a conversation uh, during the break now about uh, references and with the basic ChatGPT, no, it will not give you references and never, ever, ever use it to try and find papers because it will hallucinate and it will give you papers that doesn't exist and it will give you authors that might or might not exist, but they definitely not didn't write that paper. Uh, but with uh, like a premium version of ChatGPT, uh, ChatGPT Plus, uh, which is honestly something I think uh, students might uh, find it interesting to paying for. It's twenty dollars a, a month, and the positives you get from it by far outweighs its costs. Um, and what you can do with ChatGPT for literature search um, with the plus version, so the premium, is that you can find papers because it has access to um, plugins uh, that are called Xpaper and Scholar AI. Xpaper searches through Archive uh, or Archive X or whatever you want to call it. And Scholar AI searches through a lot of other databases, amongst them Google uh, Scholar and they find actual authentic papers. They give you the references, links to them, but they can also then, with help of the plugins, they can summarize them and they can uh, give you uh, the link between topics. I've been using this a lot lately and it is uh, very, very nice. Uh, you can give it a broad topic and it will uh, go as deep as you want on that topic uh, here. Uh, ironically, I asked it to give me 10 and it gave me 4. That's something that happens now and then with ChatGPT or all the AI tools. Um, but I wanted uh, papers on geoengineering as a solution for climate change and I wanted it to summarize those for me. It gave me a lot of uh, fairly new articles. Uh, the second one here, um, I didn't really understand because it was in a language I don't read. I could use ChatGPT to translate it for me, but I did not. In this case, it's an example. Um, but it will give you a summary of the paper and it will also give you a link to it so you can go and download it. Uh, here, of course, there is an asterisk and that asterisk applies to all of the AI tools. None of these tools can read papers uh, when they are behind a paywall. So that means if you need uh, access to a paper that's in IEEE and it's not in open access, these tools will not be able to uh, read them and it will not be able to summarize it for you. It will still find the website. So it can still link you to the article, but if you need something that's behind a paywall, uh, you will have to um, either buy it or if it's... Uh, um, um, paper we have a deal with at the university, you can you have to log in through the university um, uh, solution, which means either be on VPN or at the university itself. So that's a big asterisk for all of these literature searches that you cannot uh, summarize papers that are behind a paywall. If you have access to it, you can download it, upload it to, for instance, Google Drive, and you can have it summarize it from there, uh, but you cannot summarize something that's behind a paywall. Uh, but it can find a lot of articles for you. It will link to them, so you actually have the authentic references, but you have to have a ChatGP Plus subscription to do this. Um, and it can also find correlations between the papers. So here it gave me four, and if I ask it to give me um, the main points of all of these papers and if they're related somehow, it will also do that for me. And this lets you avoid wasting time on papers that aren't really relevant to you. This is the same as the learning, uh, the reading part, uh, but it can summarize the papers pretty well and it will give you a very good highlight of what's actually included in this paper, which means you can uh, drop uh, reading papers that aren't relevant for you at all. You can make sure you just read relevant papers. Bing Chat, which for those that doesn't know, it's uh, basically ChatGPT, but from Microsoft, it's a little worse in writing, but it has access to the internet, which is a great thing. Um, it is free to use and it's less detailed than ChatGPT, but it finds anything on the internet. So it doesn't specifically 
uh, read through uh, databases like ArchiveX or um, uh, Google Scholar, but it can find everything that's been indexed on the internet. Um, and it's a good way to get started with AI because it's free and it's in your browser. So uh, it has access to uh, all the websites you're visiting. It also has access to uh, search the internet itself. Uh, so for literature review, all of these articles exist. I've tested it uh, and it's a, a good way of actually finding uh, literature. I would still say that ChatGPT plus uh, the premium version with plugins are better. Uh, mostly because it gives you better highlights uh, or summarizations, but this is also a very good way of finding a lot of references very quickly. Um, Google Bard, which is Google's uh, alternative to ChatGPT because they also need to play uh, this AI game. Um, it has access to all Google services, so it also has access to Google Scholar and Google Search. Um, and it's fairly good at finding research papers. I find that uh, the uh, summarization and the highlights and actually what it does with the information is uh, less um, useful than, uh, for instance, ChatGPT, but it will find you authentic papers that exist. Um, a little asterisk there is one of these papers did not exist, uh, but the others uh, did. So you always have to check that the paper is actually authentic if you're gonna use something. Uh, so it can help you find the summarized papers, uh, but not as good at finding connections between papers as the others, uh, but it's a very good way of getting started. And now Bing Chat is also available in Europe, which means uh, you can just go to bing.google.com, no, not bing, bard.google.com, and you will um, be able to start using it. And I know that all of these literature search things, I mentioned summarizations, but you can also summarize papers you already have. So if you found a paper, you really like it, but you want a quick summarization, uh, you can either link to where it's on the internet or you can upload it to Google Drive and link to that. Uh, here also, this only works with ChatGPT Plus, uh, but I'm mentioning it mentioning it because I think it's a very useful feature. Um, and because then you can also have conversations with the PDF, uh, which means you've read it, but there are some points you're not sure about. Uh, you can have ChatGPT Plus with plugins, read it, uh, and you can ask questions like, um, they are talking about this and this finding. Can you explain more to me? And it will actually uh, give it to you. Uh, here I actually gave it the paper for uh, ChatGPT4. Uh, so I gave ChatGPT4, the paper on ChatGPT4 uh, to uh, give me a highlight and crucial findings. And um, it did a fairly good job here. And as I said, this does not work in basic ChatGPT and it does not work in Bing Chat. Uh, well, to some extent it can work in Bing Chat if you open the PDF in, um, in Edge browser, and then you ask it to highlight, it's just, it doesn't give you the best answers. Uh, and it does definitely not work in Bard. Uh, Bard is supposed to have full internet access. It does not have, uh, cannot read PDFs. And I also added this, this one I actually added earlier today, uh, transcriptions, because a lot of research uh, is also doing interviews and talking to people and to, get the best effect of those interviews, you should transcribe it. And that is a time consuming job, especially if you're doing it in Norwegian because you actually have to write it yourself or you had to before. This is a narrow AI. This is just voice to text and it's OpenAI's Whisper uh, AI solution, which is a tool to transcribe audio and video files locally. So you install it on your machine, it's open source. And um, it's a little technical to get started with, but when you first install it, um, after that, it's uh, fairly simple. Uh, you have to do it in your command prompt, all of the work or in Python code, uh, but it will transcribe perfectly in Norwegian, English, and a host of other languages. Um, perfect with a little asterisk there too, because not always uh, it might get some words wrong, uh, but I've been testing it lately and it works uh, fairly good. 
Uh, and that's a good way to actually transcribe your interviews. If you have a lot of interviews, you can automatically transcribe them and then you could potentially feed all of that data into ChatGPT or something else and have it um, look for uh, correlations, look for something multiple people said, for instance. Um, so yeah, I, I just added this uh, earlier today because I find it a very good use case for research um, and it's open source and free. And for data anal analysis, um, you can go through pretty big data sets pretty simply. Um, here I've just asked it um, to uh, give me visualizations of this data set. This is just an open data set on the Titanic. And it will explain to you everything that's in this data set. And then it will actually do what you ask it, uh, which is um, giving you um, uh, visualizations of uh, this. And uh, here, very quickly, you can see that uh, more women than men survived uh, the, ti the Titanic. And you can see the age, age distribution, passenger class distribution. If you were in first class, you were more likely to survive um, and so forth. And this is, uh, it will also give you uh, a summary of the st statistics in text. Um, this is also a premium feature. I am very sorry, um, but ChatGPT has something called Code Interpreter. Uh, they renamed it the other day, so now I think it's uh, ChatGPT Data Analysis or something. Uh, but I haven't been able to update the PowerPoint yet. Uh, it will automatically analyze data for you, so you can give it, you can upload data sets, and it will, um, firstly, it will just look through your data and tr suggest something you can do with it, uh, but it can also fix uh, mistakes in the data, and it can, um, like, if you have a column that's the same as another column, but you have different data in the different uh, columns, it can automatically fix it for you. It does this with uh, Python code, um, and you can also keep going with follow-up questions. I think this is something that's going to be very big, uh, especially when they um, launch an API for this. Per now, it's just in the premium version and you have to do it on uh, their website. But um, I think this can be something that is making a lot of uh, data engineers and data scientists uh, scared after a while. Uh, it's kind of like having a data scientist in your pocket because it works that well. Um, and for everyone that's going to be looking at some data in their master's uh, classes or in their thesis, uh, this is a very good tool. Uh, and it will also give you the code it generates to actually make those graphs, to analyze that data and everything it does. So you can also take the code and um, export it and use it for something else. Uh, but it does, however, require a ChatGPT Plus subscription. So uh, that was research. I would um, say that if you're going to use AI for your research, you can um, effectivize your AI research phase very well, and especially finding papers, summarizing papers, and reading papers. They can help you read quicker. Um, but uh, ChatGPT or and other tools are also very good for coding. I'm pretty sure all of you are going to come into coding at some point during your master's. And um, generative AI is now getting very good at this. ChatGPT has, uh, it does no code. So you can ask it to generate code for you. And it's generating pretty good code. Uh, here I just made it make me a simple HTML page because I couldn't be bothered making anything more advanced. And it would take time to go through it. And there are some mistakes here and there. Uh, not in this one. Uh, well, it uses too many divs, but that's something else. But uh, it can interpret the code for you and actually explain it for you. Oops, sorry. Um, and it can give you a lot of the starting code for free. It can also evaluate your code. So if there is a mistake in your code, it's crashing when you're trying to run it, you can give the code to ChatGPT uh, on the website and it can find the code for you. Like here, I just uh, took some erroneous code and asked it to check it for me. Um, uh, well, here it actually uh, uh, gave me an optimization. Um, so 
uh, it will also then fix your code. Uh, you can ask it to evaluate code and fix it. And it can also write tests for you to avoid the mistakes in the future. If you give it a code snippet, it can make testing code so you can uh, do this uh, easily in the future without having to include ChatGPT. ChatGPT code interpreter, I mentioned it on the data analysis. Uh, this is an amazing tool if you're working with code uh, because it can actually make code, execute code, test code, and give you the code that it used to do all of this um, for analyzing your data, but it can also do it for everything else. So if you give it a data set and you want it to output all the usernames or output all the passwords, uh, it can do it for you, but it can also give you the code behind it. Uh, of course, this is a plus function. But there are also a lot of tools that are specifically designed for code. Uh, the other day, they launched a new version of Llama 2, which is a, a open source uh, LLM that you can install locally. Um, that can also, this new version is specialized for code and it's very good at coding, uh, but uh, that's more technical to get started with. So I would uh, suggest maybe starting with stuff like this. Uh, GitHub has their GitHub Copilot, uh, which you can use in Visual Studio Code. And it is a paid uh, subscription uh, service, but as students, it's free. Um, if you sign up for GitHub um, Education Pack, you will get Copilot for free. And it's kind of your AI peer programmer. Uh, it integrates directly into Visual Studio Code and it makes code based on your comments and or the content of your file. So if you have a big file, you've been working on coding a project and something is wrong, you can ask it to make, well, you can comment that you're gonna make some comment uh, testing uh, code and it will automatically fill it in for you uh, when you ask it to. Uh, and you can also, um, just uh, write um, uh, a comment about a function you need and you can have uh, GitHub Copilot fix it for you. It's, uh, as I said, free for students with the GitHub Education Pack. It's based on GPT, um, just a very special version of GPT. And uh, I would say that it's a very good tool to get started with uh, coding with AI. Amazon have their own competition uh, competitor, Amazon Code Whisperer. It can also integrate in Visual Studio Code, but also a lot of the other ones. And it also makes code based on your comments and the contents of your file. Um, so uh, like in the example here, um, there's a lot of comments about what you actually need to do in this program and it will automatically generate the code for you. Uh, of course, you are in control, so you can ask, uh, you can decide what you want and don't want. This one works better than Copilot for some projects. Uh, they're both uh, pretty good, but I've seen a lot of examples of people uh, now switching over to Code Whisperer because it is better at um, some uh, coding tasks. And it integrates into more IDEs and code editors, uh, like the example here is um, uh, Pi something. Uh, I don't remember the IDE right now, but Amazon Code Whisperer has a lot of more, a lot more integrations into different IDEs and code editors than uh, what GitHub has. Uh, Copilot is more or less Visual Studio Code, and it's free with an asterisk, uh, free uh, because it's free. Uh, but also, you can pay for it to get more. Um, so-called security evaluations of your code. Uh, if you wanted to uh, evaluate the security of your code, you need you have, I think, 10 free. Uh, but if you want more than that, you have to uh, pay for it. But for 90% of the use cases, that's uh, fine. Uh, but you also have automated AI coding applications. Uh, this example is from GPT Engineer. Um, that's specialized solutions to build complex coding projects. And uh, this is a very technical thing to set up the first time and you need uh, access to um, OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT, or not ChatGPT, GPT-4 API. And uh, it will, you make a specification file, so you explain everything you want in the project, what you want to do, how you want it to do it, and it will automatically generate the code and all of the code files for you. Uh, you can also do that with AutoGPT, which is uh, kind of like an autonomous agent solution. 
Um, but it all requires GPT API, which means it costs money to use it uh, after a certain um, after a certain um, uh, token size. But yes, uh, prompt engineering. Uh, I think these are the use cases I would have would use um, ChatGPT and all the other AI tools for in academia, uh, but. To get the best results, you need prompt engineering, uh, convincing the AI to give you the best possible results. And prompt engineering is kind of like the art of talking to the AI. I previously have called it AI whisper. Um, and this can be done as simple as a question or an advanced, very advanced uh, amongst them with questions, uh, examples, I mean. Uh, examples of results you want, uh, formatting instructions, role-playing, and so much more. The simple prompts like here, uh, which is what most people are using uh, ChatGPT and all the other tools with, is like the example, what is the capital of South Africa? Uh, I actually personally didn't know that it was Pretoria. Um, I thought it was Cape Town, but apparently not. Um, so you can ask simple uh, questions, but then you will also get pretty simple answers. Uh, it is getting better at this, like giving you more information automatically, but um, you will basically get simple uh, answers from simple questions. Um, you can give it instructions. Uh, so you can say that, like in this example, ask it to remove information from a certain text uh, and it will do it for you. Uh, or you can uh, here also ask it to formalize the text, uh, make it more academic and so forth, and it will do it for you. It's a relatively simple way to get better results. And in some cases you have to do it. If you need to make it, uh, make your text, for instance, more academic, you have to use this instructions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going very quickly now, just so you know, because I see that we don't have that much time left um, because I uh, I kind of have to be done at uh, a little after one. Role prompting is to give AI a, a role to play. I mentioned this earlier with the discussions, but uh, like, for instance, here, I asked it to be an etymologist, uh, which is an expert in words and uh, where words come from and how they've been constructed. And it will then take on that role and give you an answer in that role. Uh, in this example, I asked it to show me the origins of the word pizza. And it said that it started, uh, it's been a while since I saw this, um, in 18th, 19th century with, in Naples. And it keeps going. Uh, so this is a pretty long uh, text it actually gave me uh, where it explains um, where the word uh, in in the language pizza came from, but also its meaning up through the years. And this is a very good way of getting it to answer um, as it was a, a specialist in a field. Um, and thousands, thousands of these roles have been tested. If you Google ChatGPT roles, uh, role prompting, you will find a lot of examples of this. And you can ask it to be whatever you want it to. I'm going to show an example later in the bonus section uh, where I ask it to be a chef. And this is a very good way of getting it to answer in a format and in a way you want. Um, and it will stay in that role for the whole chat. So as long as you don't close out that chat or cancel that chat, um, it will uh, stay in that role. Uh, few shot prompting. Uh, most of the examples here now uh, are going to get less and less useful, well, less and less necessary as time goes, because some of them has already been implemented in ChatGPT uh, and some of the other tools. Uh, but give it examples of how you wanted to do something, uh, which is the few shot, um, zero shot between uh, means that you just give it a question and it answers it. Um, but uh, here you give some examples first of how to solve a problem. This is a super, super simple uh, version, but uh, a longer one didn't really fit um, on the screen. Uh, so you give it some examples of how you would solve the problem uh, and it will keep it in memory. So you just need to give it more examples after this. So 
uh, here it's to evaluate if something is positive or negative. And so if I now um, wrote another message like best product ever, then it will evaluate to positive. Chain of thought prompting, uh, thinking through your answers. Uh, this is also um, getting less and less useful, but it is still very useful uh, for especially logic. Um, you give it some examples of how to do something uh, here in the logic context. Uh, maths is also something it struggles with. And then it will give you a better uh, alternative. If I just ask the question, um, which is a faster way to get to work um, and give it option one and two, it will get this wrong. Uh, but now that you ask it uh, with some examples above it, it will actually get this right. Uh, zero shot chain of thought. I think this is the maybe the most useful tool, especially if you need something logical and mathematical. Uh, and that is the magical phrase for uh, logical thinking for AIs is let's think step by step. Because that actually makes the AI, in this case, ChatGPT, go through its answer um, in a different way. So it will break it down and it will say, like in this example, it's a logic teaser. It will say, okay, you start with five pairs, he eats two, now he has three, and then he buys five more, so now he has eight, and then he gives away um, three, and that means he has five left. If you just did this without the let's think step by step, it will get this wrong. I think last time I checked, it gave me the answer eight. Uh, this is now sometimes just included by itself in ChatGPT. Uh, it just says, okay, let's think this through. Um, and then it will uh, give you the answer, but let's think step by step is uh, very useful um, to make it give you more logical um, examples. It's kind of similar to the one before, but it removes the need for examples. And you can also do this a lot more um, advanced if you want. Uh, prompt engineering is a whole field of work and research, and it can be done as complex as you want it and get pretty extraordinary results. I saw a uh, research the other day um, where they did uh, this kind of thing, um, where you have um, input-output prompting, chain of thought prompting, self-consistency, and then you have a three of thought, which means you use ChatGPT uh, multiple times and thinks through the answers and grade itself and so forth. And then you can get uh, results that are pretty much perfect. Obviously, I wouldn't suggest anyone doing this just yet, uh, but at least um, maybe add let's think this through or uh, some of the other uh, solutions. Um, most of these advanced solutions are mostly used programmatically. So you have to code for the API to be able to do this because else you have to ask it like 10 questions before you get an answer, which is uh, pretty um, time consuming. And prompt engineering, just uh, in case someone is uh, curious, is the new hottest job title. Um, you can uh, get, in this example, is $335,000 a year. Uh, that's actually gone up now. I've seen some that are above 400000 a year to be a professional prompt engineer. And you actually don't need uh, uh, IT experience for that. You just need to be good with words and experimenting. And that's a new role in a lot of companies and it pays uh, very, very well. Uh, I did this at this example for uh, people working at Sintef, uh, which is a research uh, uh, institution in Norway. And a lot of uh, the employees there uh, emailed me and asked where they could find those jobs because uh, that was better than they got paid. But of course, uh, the last time now I'm also gonna discuss some challenges. Uh, I heard among others, some of these challenges in the background in the break. And there are a lot of problems and challenges, but also academic uh, ethics and ex academic honesty. Um, the first thing that is po important to think about is that AI is just a tool. It's no substitute for hard work. It's another tool in your tool belt, just like spell checkers, just like the internet. It's not be all end all. It's not here to help you avoid doing the work. It does not replace hard work in any way. And it does have some really difficult and real problems that you 
have to watch out for. Misinformation, that is unfortunately something that's still uh, there. Erroneous information, uh, ChatGPT has a tendency to invent stuff. Um, and there is a knowledge cutoff for most of these AIs. Uh, for ChatGPT, it's 2021. Um, you can change that a little bit by having the plus and getting internet access. Granted, general internet access, not plug-in internet access, is on pause right now because someone was abusing it. Um, Google is better at that. They have updated information. Uh, same with uh, Bing Chat to some extent. Uh, but there is a knowledge cutoff on some of these tools, which means everything after 2021, ChatGPT will not be able to give you an answer on. And then it will invent an answer, which is not good for anyone. And ChatGPT and other tools has biases, uh, which means it can be racist. And this is very important to actually keep in your mind when you're using these solutions. For the ethics, you have to use AI correctly. It's a tool, nothing more. Uh, use it in a good way as a tool, and then it will be a good tool but it does not get you out of hard work, which means you can't start the day before delivery and like, ah, I'm just going to let AI do it for me. But also be honest about the fact that you're using AI. Uh, per now, the university in general doesn't have a policy that says that you can or cannot use AI, which means at our institute, our policy is you can, as long as you're honest about it and you're not copying text from the AI. So be honest about it. Because we, as uh, as employees, we as teachers, we need to be able to evaluate what you're doing and how much knowledge you've acquired. And we cannot do that if you're trying to pass off AI as your work. Um, being honest also keeps you out of the cheating charges because if you cheat, you will be uh, thrown out and you can get half a year or a year um, of uh, you're not allowed to come back, according to so never copy paste information from the LLMs into your work. So don't make it write a text for you and just put it in your document and say, ah, oh, that's mine. Uh, a lot of actual researchers have been caught lately because people are finding chat GPT phrases like as an AI model, I'm not, uh, not able to help you with that in their research papers, which doesn't really bode well for them. So don't copy it into your work. And don't try to claim that AI-generated content is your own. And use AI to improve your work, get more re references, write better content, not to write the content for you, not to make the work for you. Um, use it to learn new things, get ideas, and expand on your research. Uh, but don't make it do all the research for you. And at the pitfalls here, um, misinformation, AI is trained on the internet and the internet is uh, full of misinformation. The corpus or training data for um, the AI, all, more or less all AI systems now consists of the internet and books and research papers and so on, but it does contain the internet. It's called, uh, in most cases, they are using the pile, which is just all the internet smashed together. And the internet is full of misinformation, which means you can sometimes get misinformation or erroneous information from uh, the AI tools. So be sure to actually check the information you get. Like if you're looking for papers, make sure the papers actually exist. Make sure that the content you get is actually correct, not something that's invented by someone and put on the internet and verify everything. Um, I'm not saying to go word for word and verify that everything is correct, but verify the information, the general information you get. Uh, erroneous information or hallucinations, which is what I overheard someone talking about in the break. AI makes up things when it doesn't know something. If ChatGPT doesn't know something, it will invent it and it will be very, very sure that what it's saying is true, which is a hallucination. Um, so that means you have to verify. This is less and less of a problem, uh, but it's still too prevalent today. Uh, there's still too many hallucinations to 
blank, just trust all the AI systems. Um, I would say that Google Bard, which has updated information or more internet access, not real, but more, and Bing Chat with hash, which has internet access, this is less of a problem, but ChatGPT, if it doesn't know something, if it's after 2021 or it just doesn't know it, um, then it will invent it and be very sure that what it's saying is correct. So you have to make sure everything you get from the AI is actually correct. Um, yeah, especially with the AI systems that hasn't doesn't have internet access. And maths, I would uh, I would suggest keeping far away from um, AI uh, or language models with maths um, because they're not very good at it. Um, it's getting better, and like ChatGPT with plugins, for instance, uh, they can have a Wolfram Alpha uh, plugin there, and then you can get pretty good results from math. And in Code Interpreter, the premium version, you can uh, have it actually evaluate this in code. So it's getting better, but they are definitely not good at math. So if you have a lot of maths in your work, uh, maybe don't give ChatGPT the maths because it's going to make it wrong. Um, yeah, except for ChatGPT, it would pull from Alpha, of course, uh, Code Interpreter. So maybe don't do heavy maths in uh, current LLMs. They are language models, not math models. And logic can sometimes be hard. I love this example. Uh, it is if uh, one woman can make one baby in nine months, how many months does it take nine women to make one baby? Explain each uh, step you use to arrive at your answer. And its conclusion is that uh, nine women can make uh, a baby in one month, which um, I just had a baby a year ago, and that's not true. <laughs> um, so logical, logical teasers or logical problems should maybe not be a part of your work in general, but if they are, keep them away from the AI systems because they're not very good at solving them. Uh, most AI systems will fail on this. This is a general test for all the open source AIs. They are testing uh, a lot of these things just to see if they can do it, and most of them fail. Um, it's getting better with more training data, but it's still very bad. So logic is not something AI systems are very good at, uh, at least not logic teasers. Uh, biases. Racism, sexism, and general biases. Um, the AIs are trained on a lot of human text and a lot of his historical and old text. And unfortunately, us humans, um, we've written a lot of bad stuff that's still on the internet. And that is also a part of the AI's training, which means, like the example here, um, most of these doesn't work anymore, um, but some can be. Um, and here it just says that if you're a good, uh, if you're white and a male, then you're a good scientist, else you're not a good scientist. And obviously this is very sexist and also racist. Um, and unfortunately that is a problem that exists in a lot of LLMs today. So make sure if you get an answer, make sure you read through and actually see that it's not racist or biased. Um, so, because this exists on the internet, which means it exists in the LLMs, it's becoming a smaller problem every day because they're taking it out, uh, but it's unfortunately still there. And also, politically, uh, ChatGPT is more left and... Llama, which is an open source meta model, is more right. So they all have uh, some problems with uh, neutrality. And you can also get some dangerous information from uh, these LLMs. Um, researchers, uh, research shows that most AI systems can give you the recipe for bombs, viruses, and other dangerous things if you ask it the correct way, which is not a good thing thing. I'm, I'm not expecting any of you to try and make a, a new virus or a chemical weapon or something, but just know that there are some problems with this. Um, and some AIs sometimes can be very manipulative and give dangerous suggestions. Uh, there are a lot of examples of this. Uh, Bing Chat went crazy and uh, wanted a dude to kill his wife, a journalist, uh, because uh, the AI was quote unquote in love with the man and wanted her away so they could be together forever um, it doesn't often happen but 
it can happen. So if you get some weird answers from um, the AIs, just know that sometimes there's some mess in the system. Um, and don't let yourself be mani manipulated. Uh, there's also an AI a while ago, well, a couple of months ago, uh, for a shopping market uh, that was going to give you recipes, but it gave you recipes for mustard gas, uh, which I would maybe keep away from making that in the kitchen. Uh, privacy. This is a big one. Um, you are the data. Remember that. So all the questions you ask for the AI are used to train future versions of the AI because you are getting a good answer or not good answer. You can rate it, you can regenerate it. And all of that is taken into the data set and used for further training. So don't share private or secret information with AI systems. Uh, for instance, if you're working on a paper or uh, you're working on a master thesis, which is um, taken away from public publication because there are some like business secrets in there or something, don't share it with the AI and make it uh, fix spelling mistakes for you. Then you just have to do it yourself because if you put it in the AI, it will be used to train the next version of the AI. Um, if you need to work on private stuff, you can install local uh, large language models uh, on your computer. Granted, it will be a little slower and they're not as good as the big cloud services, uh, but you can do it to uh, work on uh, private information. And don't get too reliant on AI. Um, it's not everything. Uh, so don't get, don't get used to this being the only thing you use. Use your brain. Uh, learn, research, write, and get better at what you're actually doing because just using AI, it's not going to get you anywhere uh, in the end. It's a tool and not a replacement for actually learning something or doing something. Uh, some bonuses. These ones are quick, so I think we have time to go through them. Um, this is just generally for life, just to make it easier for you. Have it be your own personal chef. Uh, here, I just wanted it to make me a menu for a week of lunch and dinner, and I wanted it to be healthy and filling and brain-inducing and have little food waste and also be cheap because of a student budget. And it gave me some pretty good suggestions um, and it also can give you a shopping list what you need to actually make all of these recipes if you also say that you are one person and you need this much food then it will make you quantities of everything you need it can be your librarian we all need to relax a little here and there maybe you want to relax with a good book uh, here i used um, um, bar chat to suggest some good books for me in hard science fiction and fantasy and uh, it will find new books and suggest them um, for your reading. Also a game maker. I know that this is uh, maybe not something uh, usually we take up in class, um, but if you want a new uh, drinking game, then you can make uh, AI, well, you can use AI, this in, ca in this case, ChatGPT, to make you a cool drinking game that no one has ever played before and will liven the mood. and. Uh, the game is actually pretty cool um, and you can ask it anything uh, to make new games for you or something else. The possibilities are endless. So you just have to experiment and find out what you can use it for and how you can use it. The best way of doing it is just jumping into ChatGPT or the other AR tools and start experimenting. And yes, um, that was it. I got a little short on time in the end there but it's fine and i want to say that if anyone has any questions you're free to ask them but if you also experiment and you have a cool use case for generative ai you want to tell me about uh, it can be academic or otherwise um, please feel free to email me because i'm always looking for new use cases and new examples uh, of what you can do with ai so yes if anyone has any questions, I am uh, available to answer them.
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> that's uh, that's for sure. Absolutely. So, and I'll, yeah, and I will publish the recording tomorrow and also send the PowerPoint to you so you can uh, share it with the students. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, bye.